Hello, Jeff Disher here again. Today is going to be a bit of a follow-up to what I was talking about last time with memory management and specifically dynamic memory allocation because today I'm going to be talking all about garbage collectors. Before getting into specifically what a garbage collector is, this is something we're going to be using to solve a few of the problems we've mentioned before. There's issues of memory leaks, which is one of the possible problems in terms of actual correctness and, and resource use that you could run into with dynamic allocation. And the others are going to be the time it takes, the performance cost, the time it takes to ask for memory in the dynamic allocation, and also issues of the actual physical locality of the memory that you dynamically allocate. Because all of those things are some, some sort of issues that come up with this. And over time, they, they become harder to resolve in kind of perfect ways. Now we're going to be talking about two different kinds of garbage collectors as well. And also one thing which is not garbage collectors, but is often kind of roped into this. But I'll talk about what it is and why it's not quite the same. So before getting into some of those specific kinds of collectors, we're going to talk about some of the underlying technology used in them and, and the ways that you think about the problem. So you'd actually get an idea of what's possible with these different approaches and what is and isn't garbage collection and why this is useful in situations where it's valuable. So first of all, one of the things that you hear a lot when people are talking about garbage collectors is they call they talk about something called mark and sweep. Now this is um, sort of a very easy idea to understand, which is that say you've got a program that has there's an object here, which is connected to an object here, and an object here, and maybe we'll say an object here as well. And what happens there is at some point during your program, you've got these objects, and they're connected in this way. And at some point during your program's run, it stops using this one here. So now what you've created is something where this object is, it's what's called dead. It's essentially, it, it's garbage. It's what needs to be collected. It's not actually part of the active program now. It's garbage. So it should be removed. And this is how, this is where the, the whole metaphor comes from of garbage collection. Now in a mark and sweep collector, what it will do is the collector will basically know either where all the allocations were, or where in memory it put them all. And what it'll do is it'll start from what's called the roots, which is going to be maybe this object here. It's the one that we're directly holding onto and working with. And they'll say, okay, ah, there's an object. Okay, mark it. And how it stores this mark is up to the implementation. And then it'll say, okay, let's scan through this object to find out if it's connected to any other objects. And it'll go, ah, this one, mark that. Ah, this one. Mark that. Okay, uh, there's nothing else here, and these things weren't connected to anything else, so we're done. And then what it says is, anything else that I did not mark is therefore dead, so it can be swept. So sweep away the garbage to free up space. Now that means you get rid of this object, and exactly how that happens is kind of up to the implementation. We'll talk about that a bit as well. Another kind of technology that's using garbage collection, which is actually kind of neat, um, People talk about it less often, but it actually is used quite frequently. There's, it has a lot of very interesting properties to it. And this is what's called either a copy and forward, or a stop and copy, or a scavenger. And how this works is quite different. Remember in the mark and sweep approach, where we had this set of objects. And we didn't move any. We just looked at them and decided which things were alive and dead. Well, this is a very different approach. The, the scavenger, as I'll call it, uh, it actually walks through these objects the same way that Mark did, except instead of marking them, it copies them. So what's, what happens in these situations is usually you have two pieces of memory in space. You're going to have what's currently, the memory space you're currently using, or the, the, where you'd put objects before, and then what's called your survivor space. So then what you're going to do is, when you find this object, instead of marking it, you will copy it. For the survivor space, because it, it will survive the collect. Then what you'll do is, okay, well, let's go find all the other things that that points to now. Oh, it points to this guy. Okay, copy him as well, and update this to now point to the new copy. All right, and this other object left over, copy that as well. And then at the end, once it's, now it's finished, it's found everything, it'll say, okay, we're done. Let's start allocating freshly here. And next time we collect, we'll just overwrite all the memory here with what we're copying. So another kind of, something that I just wanted to add at this point, now that we've seen in a, in a copying or a scavenging collector, how data gets copied and that 
has certain nice properties to it, which we'll get into. A mark and sweep collector, normally it doesn't actually do any moving of the objects. It doesn't copy things around, just leaves them where they are. Unless you're using something which is usually referred to as a compactor. Now a compactor just uses this knowledge of where all the live objects are. It happens after you've marked everything. And it can actually do something like say, oh, okay, um, well, we know we, we, all these objects are here, so let's just, uh, this one's already at the beginning at the, of, the, of the space. Uh, this one over here, well, we'll shift it over and update this guy to point to that, and then we'll shift this one over here too. So now they're all packed together as well. Uh, and they are all updated to point to each other in their new locations. So, okay, now that there's those sort of technologies, well, what are the, what are the ways that collectors can actually be written? What, what actually do we mean there? And what problems can we solve using these? So first off, you're going to have something which is often referred to as a conservative collector. Now, conservative collectors are the kind which don't claim that they understand what you're doing at all. Um, some, this is common in situations where, say, you have a garbage collector that you're attaching to a language which is not normally garbage collected, or not what's called managed. Uh, in the case of, say, the, the BOEM GC, it's a common one used in, in languages like C and C++ to give them garbage collection behavior. Now, this is a conservative collector because it can't know when it looks at a piece of memory you asked for and tries to scan it to see, does this point to other things that I've allocated? It can't tell if that's you pointing at an object or you just storing a number that looks like that object. So it has to assume that it has to make a conservative assumption that, well, it looks like the, the thing that we're supposed to be talking about. So let's just assume that whatever we're pointing to, that's probably alive as well, and we'll scan it. So it knows a lot less about what's going on. It doesn't know what's in the memory. All it knows is where the memory is, which pieces of memory it gave out, and how big they are. And that's all it can tell you. Now, one of the this can be convenient because it can actually solve all your problems of the general case problem memory leaks at least because usually it doesn't make mistakes that often here and even if it does all it means is it's going to waste a bit of memory for a little while it's not going to be incorrect there's a few limitations though in terms of it doesn't really solve some of the other problems we were looking at it doesn't solve issues of how long it takes to allocate memory because remember it still has to find where to put those pieces of memory but make sure that it leaves sometimes a little bit of space between each piece of memory you're getting um, because it might need to stick something in there later. Um, there's, there's all this complexity with how it actually has to find things, which is basically the same as what we're doing without a garbage collector. So there's no win there. Also, because it doesn't know what these things are, it can't move anything. You can't implement a copy collector this way, because it's probably going to break something. What if it makes a mistake? Now instead of it maybe leaving some extra memory leaving sitting around for a while, now it might break your data. It might actually change a number that it thought was an object into something that's now a different number because it moved the object. So it can't move anything. Everything has to stay as it is. So well, why is that a problem if it can't move any of the objects? What's the issue with that? Well, part of the reason why you move objects, there's a few reasons for it. The first one is it actually will mean you now use less memory. There's no wasted space between anything. So it's tight, well packed that way. So that's one benefit. The other benefit is, because there's no wasted space between anything, we fix that, we, we can actually fix that locality problem in, that we had in performance, where when you dynamically allocate things, they might not be close together. Well, if you can move objects, you can move them close together. So because a conservative collector can't do these things, really all it's giving you is the ability to solve that memory leak problem. So these are convenient, um, but they're not very ambitious in terms of the greater problems that can be solved by garbage collectors. The other kind of garbage collector, which is what you're going to see in high performance environments like a Java virtual machine or, or most other VMs, um, is what's called a precise collector or a sometimes it's called a type safe collector. Now this one's different in that it knows what you're doing, which means you can't just ask it for memory. You instead say, I want you to allocate one of these things that I've already told you about. And then the collector can say, okay, here's how much memory I want to give you for that. And the collector might decide to give you a weird amount of memory. You can't assume how big things are because maybe it has a clever way of storing this. 
So it'll give you memory, and it now knows, okay, I know that right at the beginning of an op this object, because they told me what type of object it is, right at the beginning of that kind of object, there's something that points to an object. So now, it's not just looking at anonymous chunks of memory and trying to make conservative assumptions as to what's inside them. Now it knows specifically what's inside them. It'll know, for example, well, a pointer, something that points to memory, pointing to another object, is not the same thing as a number that the users store. They're very, very different. Uh, and this is why languages like Java, for example, even at the high level in the Java language, but also on the bytecode level, the way that the specification works, there's a difference between these things. It's not, you know, you can't treat them interchangeably. They're, they're totally different. So what's the benefit about this? It seems like all we've done is just move a lot of complexity into the collector. Well, there's some interesting things you could do now because you can move objects. Now, the collector knows what everything looks like. It can safely change the objects. It can safely move the objects. So now you're not limited to just doing a basic mark and sweep. Now you can do a mark sweep compact, which will give you the really tight objects in very small amount of space. Or you can do the, the, the copying collector, the scavenger, which will pack everything together really tightly and very quickly, although it uses kind of some wasted memory leave some wasted memory for the, the survivor space because it has to switch. So this is very valuable because now it means that, well, that locality problem we were talking about can be solved. We can actually put things really close together. What's really neat is the collector might be able to figure out which kind of closer together you want. Remember, the copying collector, it found each object from the objects that referred to it it knows which things are logically close together, which means it can put them physically close together. Now there's some heuristics to figure out what happens if there's more than one option, but basically you know a lot about this already. So it can actually do a lot to improve the, the actual locality that you're gonna get between the objects. In fact, if you look at a lot of benchmarks for different garbage collectors running on different kinds of workloads, you typically see the ones that try and do really aggressive packing together of objects, they actually do better. Even though they spend longer, more time packing things together, the program runs so much faster because everything's right up against each other. It's really, really valuable. And it's often something that people don't realize is a great benefit you get from having a garbage collector. But wait, there's more. Now that we can move objects, well, why are we wasting all that time when we try to find memory in the first place, we used to have this pro like back in the dynamic allocator, we'd have to leave space between things sometimes because, well, we might need like to, to stick something small between these two objects and now there's, you know, there's holes in memory everywhere and stuff like that. Well, okay, that wasted memory. Also, it was really, really slow. Benchmarks on dynamic allocators are terrible. They're very, very slow by comparison to pretty much anything else. But now, well, why would we bother doing that? We can move the objects, right? Let's just put them all in a big line. That takes no time. Like, literally, it takes like two instructions. So this can now be done really, really quickly. You want to allocate an object? Boom, there it is. Well, where's the next one? Uh, right beside it. Where's the next one? Right beside that. Well, OK, but now what if half of these die? And now there's all this weird Swiss cheese, all this empty space between the live objects. Oh, whatever, we'll just move them. We'll shove them all together. Look, perfectly packaged again. There was no need to do anything. You didn't have to make that decision up front. You could make it perfectly when you needed to. So that's another great benefit you get in garbage collectors. So that solves the issue of the memory leak issue, the correctness problem and resource consideration we had. It also solves the issue of the actual physical locality of the memory when you're running but it also solves the cost in allocating the memory in the first place. So this can be really, really valuable, and that's why a lot of these, in a lot of these systems, things work a lot faster than a lot of people think they should. So to wrap things up, I just wanted to talk about the one kind of technology I was going to mention, which is not a garbage collector technology, but people often refer to it alongside these, and I'll talk about some of the issues related to that. And this is what's often referred to as reference counting. So what is reference counting? Well, remember before when we were talking about marking objects? 
Reference counting is a bit like taking that to a further extreme, where instead of, oh, when the collector runs, you mark it as either alive or dead, instead the reference counting is based on the idea that every time you can make that connection between objects, like we had those objects like before, let's increment a counter on that object. So it, we know, oh, it's, it's referred to by more than zero other objects, so it's a lie. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, there's actually several. The first problem is it doesn't work. Um, you can have this problem called a cycle, where what if we have an object here that refers to an object here? And that object refers back to the one here. Now these objects point to each other. If nothing points to either of them, they are dead. Yet their reference counts will be one, which means they will not be collected. So this doesn't solve the memory However, there's other problems too. One of the other problems with this is, where are you putting that reference count? You're now using more memory. So now all your pieces of memory, all your objects just got bigger. So now you're wasting memory, you're pushing things further away in the cache, and that's gonna cause some performance overhead. Uh, not tons, but it will be measurable. Also, when are you updating those, those reference counts? Well, whenever you drop a reference to an object. Okay, so what happens then if I have an object here and I get rid of it? Now it referred to two other objects, one here and one here. So, okay, I decrement their counts. So now they're both down to zero, we'll say. All right, well, they each connected to all four of these objects here. So we have to go reduce the count from two to one on each of these, then the other path from one to zero, and then free those. So I've now written to memory, I've now written memory in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven spots. I've now done eleven memory writes just to remove this one object. That's very expensive. In fact, that's incredibly expensive and over time it's getting even more expensive. So this could be a real problem. So yes, garbage collectors take some time to run, but they you can usually figure out when they're going to run. In this case, yeah, you might be able to determine when this is going to happen, so you always be able to prove certain, certain responsiveness qualities, and that is true, but it's not free, and that's how a lot of people treat this. So yes, it may be in some ways more deterministic, um, at least potentially, uh, it's not necessarily faster. One of the other things to remember in this is how are you actually doing that right? What happens if multiple CPUs are doing this at the same time? If I have two objects here and one here, and we'll say something else already refers to it. It already has reference count one. These two guys go, okay, let's update our pointers. I'll update the one to two, and this guy goes, oh, I'll update the two to three. But what if they get there at the same time? Which can happen. Now they both go, ah, I'll read a one. I'll increment them to two. I'll write a two, I'll write a two. We're done. Now it's wrong. Because now, three things connect to it. But it only thinks two of them do. This means you need to lock or perform what's called an atomic operation. This can get very expensive. So while reference counting can be useful in certain situations, and it can sometimes augment collectors in certain situations, um, it's generally not considered garbage collection. Um, it may be valuable in your environment, but in general it doesn't solve the problem, and that's why it's not really considered part of what's usually associated with garbage collection. So anyway, I hope that explained that that was a very quick way of looking at kind of the interesting things that can be done with garbage collectors, why they can do a lot more than you think they do. They're implemented probably in more varied ways than you could normally imagine, and why they're probably a lot faster than you think. Uh, anyway, leave any comments or questions here if you will, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.